Porcelain plates are on the agenda this week. I've been making a variety of shapes, each from about three to three and a half pounds of clay, or about 1.4 to 1.7 kilos. Plates aren't something I make too many of, but I always really enjoy it when I get the chance. As always, the process begins with wedging out the clay, and to make my life a little more easy, I make sure to use clay that's incredibly soft. So soft, in fact, I probably wouldn't use it to throw anything that's tall, such as a vase or a simple cylinder or anything else like that. Whereas with plates, my entire focus is on centering the clay really well and then squashing it down into a flat disc. Height isn't so much of a concern, which means I can use porcelain that's very soft, which makes the centering of it very trivial, which is nice for a change, as the soft clay just does exactly what you want. This is the pad of clay I attach my MDF throwing bats onto. I find with porcelain, Having some grooves or a somewhat rough surface helps the wood to stick and then all I do is slightly wet the leather hard clay and then place the bat on top, tap centering it into the middle, a process which usually in itself causes enough friction for the bat to stick down firmly. Throwing on bats like this doesn't really have any advantages over other methods, it's simply the way I was taught in college and since then the method has stuck. The clay is then slammed into the middle of the wheel, firm enough that it sort of sticks in place by itself initially. And then my first movement as I'm centering is to push the clay down and I use my little finger on my right hand to seal the gap at the bottom where the clay meets the MDF. And then the real centering can begin. I start by pushing down around the outside of the clay to form a nice round top. And this way, when I cone it upward, a divot doesn't form in the top of the cone as I force it upward and then as I push it down I lean it over to one side and this causes the clay to bulge at the bottom of the mass rather than in your hands. I then repeat this coning up and down process about three or four times and with each cone I can feel the clay becoming smoother and more centered. Once again I make sure I have a rounded top otherwise as I push the clay up, a hollow can form in the top of the cone, and when it comes to pushing it down, you end up trapping air and slip in the mass of clay. The cone is then lent to one side and gently coaxed back down. Now that the clay feels perfectly centered and is running true beneath my hands, it's time to compress it and push it down. To do this, I use the flat of my palm to push down on top whilst also constraining the form from the outside with my left hand. A lot more pressure is being pushed from above, but the hand on the outside is still important as it helps to keep the entire piece of clay under control. Then, at a certain point, I use a wet sponge to slowly ease the clay outward from the middle and it's really at this point that I'm beginning to form the plate into two distinct parts. These are the flat base and the outer flange. And as I drag the clay out, I really compress the base, as I don't want these to crack as they dry. As if there's one thing porcelain famously likes to do, it's S-crack on large expanses like this. So I make sure to compress a lot, and if I do come across any small air pockets, I just stab them with a needle and then continue throwing. Once the clay has been roughly distributed into these two sections, I can then move on to throwing the flange and forming the plate properly. I begin by throwing that thicker outer section upward, even though eventually this section will angle outward. I always prefer to begin by throwing it up vertically and then angling it downward. And I just do this as I feel I have more control, as opposed to immediately throwing it outward where I think there can be a tendency for the flange to sometimes flop downward. And throughout this part, I try to keep the rim relatively substantial. I do this because as the flange is angled downward, it'll stretch as the circumference becomes wider. So if it were already very thin at this stage, by the time it's thrown outward, it would be razor sharp and could easily split. I then gradually throw it to the angle I want instead of doing it all in one movement which I may very well do with the stoneware that I usually use. But again, with porcelain, I just take everything a little bit more slowly. Once I'm more or less happy with the form, 
I can begin to clean it up. I begin by sponging out any excess slip or water and that way I can more clearly see what I'm doing. When throwing these, I purposefully leave enough clay on the outside to support the overhanging walls. If, for instance, I didn't flatten it nearly as much when I was centering the clay and I attempted to open up the form and create the plate from a far more narrow lump, then there's a really high chance that the walls would just flop over as there wouldn't be much underneath them supporting them. I then use a flat metal edge to form the base of the plate. I scrape away a thin layer of clay and I'm also compressing the clay downward as I work. I then do the same for the outer rim. And it doesn't need to be perfect at this stage as I'll be trimming these quite thoroughly anyway. But as long as the rough shape is there, I'll be able to trim and refine this form a lot once it's leather hard. I then soften and stabilize the rim with the chamois leather and then I remove some of this excess clay. Not loads of it, just the really wet stuff, as this will help the pot to dry out to leather hard a bit more quickly, which is also why I remove as much slip as I possibly can from the rest of the plate and its surfaces. The back is then scraped clean, and then I very carefully drag a taut wire underneath it. And taut is the important word here, as I don't want the metal wire to slacken and then bow upward, as if it does so, it can remove clay that you need later on to trim the foot ring from. Occasionally, wiring through the form can cause a little wobble to be set into the rim of the pot. As the rims of these are quite substantial, I can just take my chamois leather, drape it back over the rim and try to stabilize it. I then pry the bat off, usually gently, from a few spots all around the bat. That way I don't bend the piece too much, which could happen if I were to force it off from one place. And here are just some of the plate forms I was throwing, each a little different from the last, which will hopefully be glazed in my new black or white, or the new purple lichen glaze, which I showcased a few videos ago. The wheel I use, for all those who do ask, is a Rhoda HMT500. It has a nice wide tray and a hose too which drains into my reclaim bucket, a feature which isn't seen so much on modern wheels. And here's a selection of the tools I use for trimming. There's a lot of them these days, and they aren't all used for every single pot. Some are quite situational, but I thought I'd take this moment to go through them. These tungsten carbide trimmers are made by Jay Jun Lee. They really are as sharp as a knife, and they tend to chatter an awful lot when using stoneware clay. But for porcelain, they're perfect. They cut through it like a hot knife through butter. I'd say they aren't the most beginner-friendly tools. I think they have quite a steep learning curve, and all it takes is one wrong move to destroy a pot. Or, as you're turning, if you angle the tool slightly incorrectly, they'll take out a giant gouge, or they'll catch on the pot and rip it off-center. So I think it helps having quite a lot of turning experience before using these. These trimmers are my bison turning tools. They have the same tungsten carbide blades, so they're exceedingly sharp, and their looped shapes make them a bit easier to use, I think. These loop turning tools are my cheap ones. I wear through them quickly, and they really aren't the best quality, but they do have shapes that I quite like. These ones I sharpen myself occasionally, just with a file or a bench grinder. Then there's my Maker's Mark, a brush, a spinner, which is made by Richard Carter, who's a potter and an incredibly talented engineer who used to make center pins for fishing rods, which are really sought after these days. I recommend searching for them online as they're really beautiful objects. Anyway, his spinners have ball bearings in, which I find very useful. Then there's a torch, which I use occasionally with porcelain for checking the thickness of the walls. And then I have a bunch of different metal ribs, which I use for scraping or burnishing or even trimming different shapes for different pots. Their edges are worn really sharp through use as they're constantly sharpened by the abrasive ceramic. And then there's my mud tools rubber kidney, which more or less just does the same job as the metal ones, just with a softer touch. I begin by tap centering the plate into the middle of the wheel and I secure it firmly in place with three lumps of soft clay which are pushed around the base of the pot. And then I can begin to trim. 
and for this I'm using one of my hook ice and turning tools to skim over this surface and make it nice and flat whilst also removing some of the extra weight. Trimming the inside of pots like this is always a little bit irritating because the turnings just accumulate where you're working and I'm constantly having to fish them out. But that's what I get, I suppose, for choosing to trim these areas and really refine them. In these wintry dark months, I use a spotlight while I work, which explains the dramatic lighting on much of this footage. At the moment the sun sets at about 4pm, and I can't wait for that to get later, as I so much prefer working in natural light, as opposed to these harshly lit scenes. Once I've trimmed the internal base, I go over it with a flat kidney, compressing it and really pressing it smooth. I want it to be as flat as it can possibly be, and the rubber kidney is quite good for doing this, as I can compress the clay really firmly without it removing too much material. Once the majority of the inside portion is trimmed, I just spend a moment really defining this inner ledge. I want it to be a sharp right angle, so that it really slices through the glaze when it's coated over it. As I want the outer flange to be as straight as possible, I use a straight blade to trim this area. As I trim, I'm resting my working hand on my left hand, just to add stability to the process. It might look like I'm resting my hands on the plate itself, but in no way am I doing that. My forearms are resting against the plastic of the wheel tray, and my elbows are tucked into my waist, and onto all of that I'm leaning my upper body weight, all in an effort to keep my arms and hands as steady as possible as I trim. So, in actuality in this position, my hands are sort of floating in place, hence why adding stability with the rest of your body is so important. Although you can't really see it, the thumb on my left hand is underneath the flange of the plate, and as I trim, it's constantly there, judging the thickness of the areas I'm turning. Once I'm happy with how it visually looks from this side, I can begin to tidy up all these surfaces, and to get rid of many of the turning lines, I simply press in the rubber kidney, which burnishes the clay and scrapes away a very thin outer layer. I then spend a few more moments just cleaning up this inside corner, and then I can very carefully remove it, flip it upside down, and place it back onto the wheel. It should sort of stay in place under its own weight, so I use that in order to trim right down on this section of the rim before I position the lumps of clay around it to keep it firmly in place. My left hand hovers above, applying a very slight downward pressure, but really it's just monitoring what's going on at this stage. If the plate begins to be pulled off centre, it's that hand and the fingers that'll notice it first, rather than my eyes which are focused on the turning. After I've trimmed the lower section, I can secure the plate down with three soft bits of porcelain, and then I can proceed onto the more aggressive trimming. As I'm removing much more mass, it helps to have the piece secured in place, whereas previously I was only really skimming a very thin layer off the surface. On the outside of this plate, I'm following the inside form. And once again, I don't try to remove too much in any one go, rather I strip away the porcelain layer by layer, rather than all in one go as doing so would mean I'd have to apply a lot more pressure with the tool and really dig it in, and the most likely outcome of that is that I'd probably just destroy the pot. I then use a flat metal edge to burnish over these areas and to remove the worst of the trimming marks, and then I can begin to turn the base. Here, I use a very sharp tool, and I make sure that most of my pressure is being pushed horizontally rather than vertically down into the clay, as it's very easy at this point to deform the thin base. If you are using blunt tools and you do this, the amount of pressure needed to simply get the tool to slice away clay is often enough that the base simply bows inward anyway. So it's times like this where sharp tools really become useful. 
continue trimming and really it's by sound that I can tell when it's more or less the correct thickness. A high pitched thud means that it's thin. You'll also be able to feel that it's hollow, like when you're tapping on a wall to find a cavity. A lower thud means that it's thicker, and in this case, that was at the corner where the base meets the outer flange, which is pretty normal. The last bit of work to be done is to trim the foot ring itself, which in this case just means trimming a slight groove into the base. This creates an area that'll act as a glaze catch and an area that I'll easily be able to lift and manoeuvre the plate with. Without it, lifting the plate away after it's been trimmed would be incredibly difficult to do without deforming it. Unless, of course, you were trimming on a throwing bat, in which case you could just remove that and then place another bat onto the base and flip it over that way, which truthfully is what I should have done for this piece. And now I can just continue to remove thickness from this outer flange until it's nice and thin and as straight as it can be. I'll be able to feel if it gets too thin as the flange itself will begin to buckle inward. So I work carefully, not removing too much at any one time. Generally, I think I find myself spending more time turning porcelain than I do stoneware. With the slightly grogged iron rich stoneware I normally use, I feel as if I can leave the turning marks to be slightly more obvious and present. They sort of match the character that the clay has itself, whereas with this porcelain I find myself turning it to be as immaculate and as perfect as it can possibly be, within my own range of skills of course. There are some potters who take it to a completely different level, who've been working with porcelain for years. I think I still have some time before I get there yet. And finally, I press in my maker's mark onto this outer facet on the foot ring. And as that does cause the clay to be pushed upward ever so slightly where it is pressed, I just go over this top surface one more time. I then very carefully lift it away and place it onto a bat. And from this point onward, this is how I flip the plate if I need to. Compress between two throwing bats so that I never pick it up by the rim or the foot as handling flatware badly can cause it to deform, even if it doesn't look like it at this stage. I then took the piece back over to the wheel and I just run this rubber kidney across the base one last time, pushing the clay back down flat as it had bowed inward slightly from being suspended upside down and I couldn't resist to turn the rim one last time just to really define the outer edge as I want the sharp edges to really break through the glaze once it's applied. And that's it. A very simple, elegant form. Let's hope it stays that way after it's been glazed and fired. That's all for this week. Thanks for watching, as always. And Merry Christmas.